People do make a lot of how our technology is changing the way we deal with the world. Psychologists have a term for what you can do with things physically, uh, affordance. And technology is changing our affordances with the world pretty dramatically, obviously. I mean, um, if you think about it, we can travel a lot faster and further. I've seen far more of the world than my two generations ago ancestors would ever have seen. Um, and, and yes, there is a sense in which things are very different now, but I'm not at all sure that it's really changed the way we think all that much. Um, so we, we've got pretty much the same amount of processing power between our ears that, that every human has had for about half a million years or more. And what seems to be the case is that humans learn just enough about their technology and their environment to be able to make a living in it. So if you stand back and look at the range of technology, yes, it's overwhelming, but in fact, most people only learn the bits that they have to deal with. Uh, for instance, you've learned how to use the cameras, right? Um, I've learned how to uh, search historical books that have been scanned as a historian. Um, my mother can't do either of those things, <clears throat> yet she managed to make her way quite happily. And I do think we tend to overdraw how much the uh, uh, affordances of technology are changing us as individuals. Our society is very much more complicated. There's broader and more rapid communication. There's uh, greater trade between populations. But humans have always traded and they've always had culture and they've always had technology. And if you don't think that stone tools are complex, I suggest you try making some. Um, you know, they're very complicated pieces of technology to, to make a proper uh, stone axe or arrowhead, really difficult. I think that um, the idea that human beings are now in some sort of new environment that they've never been in before, I don't think that's real. I don't think that's true. We are in this, our natural environment right now. Right? We were in our natural environment before there were cities. We are in our natural environment when we um, farm. We're in our natural environment when we hunt. We're in our natural environment when we paint on walls and when we paint on computers. The fact is, um, I don't think that we have somehow left our natural environment. We're constructing this society, this technology, this economy. Um, we construct our divisions of of nationality and ethnicity and all of these things and consequently we construct things that we are capable of dealing with. So I don't actually think it really changes the game for us as individuals or for us as small groups. It massively changes the game in terms of what we're doing to our environment and how we are changing it. Ultimately I think not for the better but um, I'm not sure that I would draw the conclusion some people draw that this technology is, um, to use a, a rather silly phrase, the next step in evolution or something of that kind. Um, quite apart from the fact that evolution has no next step other than the ones it actually takes. We won't know that till it does it. Um, I don't think that technology is really changing us all that much. Uh, at least no more so than the invention of writing or the invention of um, money, or and so on and so forth. You know, yes, um, uh, vision correcting glasses. He said, wearing his vision correcting glasses. I think that um, every bit of technology that humans have ever come up with changes them. Uh, in the sense that, in order to use them, you've got to learn how to use them. You've got to learn what they're good to be used for. Uh, Susan Greenfield, who's the head of the uh, Royal um, um, Institute in, in Britain, is fond of saying computers are changing our minds. Well, yeah, duh, books change our minds, art changes our minds, changes the way our brains behave. You know, if you've learnt to play a musical instrument, that's changed the way your brain behaves. Right? We are massively adaptive. 
uh, individually. We can learn lots. That's what learning is about. It changes your brain. Is it changing our brains in ways that we can't deal with? I don't think so. I really don't. I'm not saying it's all perfect. Technology has downsides as well as upsides. Uh, but it always has had. Right? On the other hand, if I wanted to pick a time in history to get sick, this is the one. Right? That technology is pretty damn good. And I think that um, uh, we're just a little bit melodramatic when we draw these distinctions between us in our natural state, whatever that might have been, right, uh, and us in our technological society. The, the Dunbar number varies between, you know, it's set at around 150, but it varies up as high as 300. Um, uh, and small network theory, which is, uh, you know, six degrees of Kevin Bacon, all that sort of stuff, uh, suggests that we will never really be able to track more than about 300 individuals at any one time. Now, the, the problem here is one of working memory. Most people can remember about 150 individuals, their names, what you owe them, what they owe you, uh, how to behave around them, whether they're nice or nasty, etc., whether they're going to, you know, beat the living bejesus out of you or whether they're going to shout you a beer, all these sorts of things. It's a working memory constraint and our brains have a limit and that's the standard explanation of Dunbar numbers. That hasn't changed in the last 10,000 years. Since cities began, right, we still have the same working memory constraints that we had 10,000 years ago, which means it doesn't matter if you're living in Tokyo or Beijing or Sydney, right, the likelihood is you're going to encounter around about 150 individuals. Terry Pratt it says there's 150 real people, all the rest are cardboard cutouts, right? Uh, the, the person that you deal with at a shop that you're only going to go with once, you have a standard role, a ritualized set of behaviors that gets you through that transaction. But if you go to that shop every day for 50 years, then you get to know this person and their grandchildren and the problems they're having and what they like and all this sort of stuff. And you form a social relationship. So in a complex society, what we do is we, we um, solve some of the complexity of the calculations and the memory that we need in order to deal with all these people that we're dealing with by making these things uh, ritualized and stereotyped. And you treat your waiters this way, you treat a taxi driver that way, you treat people on the train this way, you treat your boss that way. Right? These are standard roles, social roles. And it's a lot easier to remember a, st a, a social role that lots of people fall into than it is to remember each individual. And that's what we do. That's why we form complex societies, because we're able to um, use what evolution gave us to track individuals in small groups to track roles, to track stations, as they used to call it in the uh, 19th century, right? And you know that if you have a certain station in society, you have certain duties and expectations and obligations and rights, okay? And I think this is an explanation of why people tend to dehumanize those who are other, right? Uh, ethnically, religiously, uh, racially uh, in to that extent that there is actual racial variation in humans and they do this because they're only ever seeing these as these people as roles as stations and not as individuals you'll often find for example a racist has friends who are of the group that they denigrate and they say oh yes but they're different okay uh, like the the you know anti-semite who has Jewish friends I've known a couple. Uh, so if you think about it, we are offloading a lot of the hard work, the hard conceptual and mental work of dealing with people by looking at other people simply as role fillers, as placeholders. Andy Clark first came up with the notion of the extended mind. And this is the idea that we, we use the environment to store information. Uh, there used to be a thing called the art of memory in the uh, pre-literate, pre-universal literacy days where people who couldn't read but had to remember a lot of stuff 
would visualise a mansion or a wall with niches in it, and they would put things to be remembered at certain places in these mental palaces, palace of memory, they were called. Uh, and then they'd be able to retrieve them a lot more easily. They were able to remember an enormous amount of stuff. Now, that's something that we do literally and physically when we record something on a piece of paper, in a book, um, in a computer or, or on the wall or, you know, whatever. So humans do um, use the environment to extend their memory. I think that... Um, the extended mind thesis goes a little bit further than that because we start to see things like if you're a, a professional golfer, the golf club is an extension of your body, right? Uh, if you're a carpenter, uh, uh, you know, a fitter or a joiner or something like that, your tools are an extension of your body. You don't think about how to use them. They are used by, you know, you've trained for many years and so your, your body is now bigger than it used to be, right? Uh, I'm fond of saying that um, my electronic hindbrain remembers more than I do about my life. Um, and um, so I only keep the stuff I'm currently working on in the forefront of my brain. Uh, all the other stuff I store on computer. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a sense in which I think we do and always have used the environment. Think about um, Australian Aboriginal paintings, right? To Europeans, they look like abstract patterns. To uh, an indigenous Australian, they look like information about your country, about where the water is, where the hunting is, uh, how to get from there to there, and all this sort of stuff. It's it's uh, an external shared form of of, of mentation, uh, and that's what we've always done. We've always done that. So again, I don't want to denigrate the the idea, but I just don't think it's as radical as some people think it is because we've got electronic computers. We used to say the same thing about books. Right? We used to say the same thing about cuneiform tablets uh, or wax tablets or whatever they used to record things in those days. And um, we're getting good at it. And you know, my life would have been much impoverished had I not had my Apple computers, not Windows, that's horrible stuff, but Apple. Um, but nevertheless, a computer is really just a much smarter notebook. That's all it is, right? You can find things more quickly. You can store things in more detail. Um, you can do things with it you couldn't do with a notebook. But in the end, conceptually, it's exactly the same, in my view. Um, or at least those aspects of storing external stuff. Um, you know, when you start getting to modeling the world and you know, the internet of things, we're dealing with something else.